Hello, I'm back with another segment talking about Pavlovian conditioning. How many of these segments, <laughs> you might ask, are there? Well, there, there's a lot of aspects of Pavlovian conditioning, so there's potentially we could keep going on this the rest of the semester. But today we're going to talk about the nature of the Pavlovian conditioned response. And you might wonder why that's worth talking about. It's pretty obvious, you know, Pavlov presented this a tone or visual cue before meat batter, dog salivate in response to the meat batter, and then they learned, came to salivate in response to the tone. End of story. And for some, that has been the end of story. That's essentially was the end of the story for B.F. Skinner, who took uh, Pavlov's paradigm, salivary conditioning, and... Uh, uh, presented it as uh, uh, having characteristics that are true of all forms of conditioning. And the characteristics that he pointed out is that uh, the conditioned stimulus uh, elicits uh, uh, as, uh, the same kind of behavior that the unconditioned stimulus elicits. Uh, so the, uh, because the conditioned stimulus elicits the same kind of behavior, uh, he's uh, used the term Stimulus substitution, the conditioned stimulus comes to substitute for the unconditioned stimulus, elicit the same kind of responses. And in Pavlov's situation, the response was a glandular salivary response. And Skinner suggested that uh, Pavlovian conditioning is primarily concerned with conditioning of glandular kinds of physiological responses. Well, uh, he... Uh, talked about that Pavlovian conditioning in those terms about 65 years ago. <laughs> and people in applied behavioral analysis have continued to think about Pavlovian conditioning in, the, in those terms. Uh, but in fact, uh, it, they miss a lot of interesting things about Pavlovian conditioning, uh, if that's how you characterize it. If we may look at the next slide the first slide for today. So stimulus substitution is one way to characterize the nature of the Pavlovian conditioned response. A more accurate way to think about conditioned behavior is that it is a preparatory response that prepares uh, on the subject for interactions with the unconditioned stimulus. And because the subject is becoming prepared to, to respond to the U.S., it, the way in which it responds to the U.S., gets altered through the conditioning process. Okay, so I'm going to uh, try to present three different forms of Pavlovian conditioning, three types of experiments. And let's go to the first of those experiments here, which is concerned with fear conditioning. This is of uh, fear is, uh, Pavlovian conditioning is really powerful in uh, conditioning emotions. Uh, we become fearful when we hear certain sounds. Uh, we become happy and relaxed when you hear other kinds of sounds through associations with either aversive or appetitive stimuli. You know, kids love the sight of their grandparents. Why? Because the grandparents often give them stuff. And so the sight of the grandparents is associated with lots of toys and positive things. Uh, kids may have a very different reaction uh, to uh, uh, a dog, for example, that barks if uh, the dog has chased them or, uh, they, uh, you know, uh, I hope not, but maybe even bit them. So we study fear conditioning in the laboratory. Um, that's a prominent form of conditioning. Lots of experiments have been done on this, usually with rats and mice. Uh, rats are on a grid floor, and uh, something like a noise comes on for 30 seconds, and then they get uh, a brief shock through the grid floor. The shock is more surprising than anything else. It's not actually painful. In fact, one of the requirements for people doing experiments uh, involving fear conditioning is that you need to, uh, ex an experimenter needs to test out the shock. And you know, I felt the shock, and it's, you know, it's surprising more than painful. Okay. So what does, how does the rat come to respond to the noise if uh, after a number of these trials? Well, what it 
uh, does is it freezes, it quits moving when the uh, noise comes on and on the bottom axis sh shows the results of an actual experiment in which uh, we plot the percentage of time during the noise CS. The subject is immobile, frozen. And you can see the first trial, the rat's moving around just fine, noise doesn't phase him, keeps moving. By the second trial, he's freezing about 50% of the time. On the third trial, he's freezing uh, what's that? 70 percent of the time, and that's about asymptote. Uh, so very quickly, the rat acquires this freezing behavior. Now, <clears throat> freezing is very different from the reaction to the shock itself. Uh, the reaction to the shock itself is the rat jumps, and when the noise comes on, the rat doesn't jump; it, it freezes. It does just the opposite. Uh, in a sense, it prepares for the shock by uh, freezing. Why does it freeze? Well, that's uh, a theory that explains why it freezes is shown in the next slide, which uh, illustrates the predatory uh, imminence continuum or the defensive behavior system as it uh, was uh, uh, formulated by Michael Fensler and his associates. So this shows a uh, level of danger. Uh, think about a, a mouse that's uh, trying to avoid getting uh, eaten by a snake. <laughs> there are some places where there are no snakes. That's totally totally safe place. There may be an area where a snake might appear, but we haven't seen one lately. If you've actually seen the snake, uh, uh, that's uh, the, when the predator is detected. And when the snake actually attacks, well, when the snake actually attacks, this uh, mouse jumps up in the air. And if it jumps up in the air, it can usually jump out of the way of the snake and scurry away. But if it's detected the snake, if, uh, the predator has been detected, then the rat freezes. And uh, uh, if you freeze, if you don't move, you become invisible in nature. Uh, often, uh, if you go walking around nature trying to see things, you don't see animals. You don't see mammals. <laughs> Why don't you see mammals? They're usually frozen because you're a predator. Well, so that's the uh, defensive behavior system. And a conditioning procedure is superimposed on this. So the shock is, is uh, uh, a, a form of kind of getting bitten by the snake. So it it uh, simulates a predatory attack. The noise comes on before the shock. So the noise comes on at earliest stage in the, in the system. And the natural behavior at that earlier stage is the instinctive response is freezing. So that's the conditioned response to the CS. So that's one of the experiments I wanted to share with you. The next experiments I want to share with you is, has been done in uh, the context of sexual conditioning. Uh, with uh, quail, Japanese quail in, in particular. So we may have the next slide. Uh, in an appetitive behavior system, and this could be, a, it, it could be food, and this just happens to be a sexual conditioning experiment. Uh, so a male is looking to have sexual interactions with a female. Uh, initially, he has to find a female. Uh, if he knows where the female is, and he can kind of, you know where she lives, he can go look for her. And uh, then, of course, when you find a female, you can engage in uh, uh, various forms of social interaction. Now, if you do a sexual conditioning experiment, uh, access to a female is the unconditioned stimulus, and you present a, a conditioned stimulus uh, shortly before that. And so the CSUS pairing is again superimposed on a behavior system. And the question is, what is going to be the response to the CS? Well, if the uh, CS occurs at this point, it's going to elicit focal search behavior, which is the subject is going to go looking uh, for the CS. So the next slide shows you the, an experimental setup that was used by uh, uh, Melissa Burns. Casado, uh, which involved a really large, <laughs> really big experimental chamber, eight feet long here, about three or four feet this way. Female was in a compartment over here. The male bird was roaming this big, big chamber. And uh, the condition stimulus was a light that came on on the 
wall opposite to where the female uh, was released. And the question is, uh, we, we know the uh, condition stimulus is going to generate focal search behavior. Where is the male going to search? Is it going to search where the condition stimulus is, or is it going to search where the female might be released? Well, we'll show you right here where the male searches. <laughs> Yeah, I, you turn on the condition stimulus, the male runs over there, and uh, and he's really interested in that condition stimulus because the condition stimulus has become associated with the female. And this behavior is called sign tracking. And the sign tracking is a prominent form of Pavlovian conditioning. Uh, through sign tracking, uh, the condition stimulus is usually a localized, something like a light. Uh, and becomes associated with food or sexual reinforcement. And then the subject will approach that light and he'll continue to track it, even if you move the condition stimulus to other locations. Uh, sign tracking is a prominent feature of behavior in this uh, uh, quail situation. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's not a glandular response. It, it involves active interaction uh, with the environment, tracking signals. There are individual differences in sign tracking that people have been really interested in because individuals who have a greater propensity for sign tracking also seem to have a greater propensity for drug addiction, which <laughs> uh, reminds me of the next experiment that I want to talk about, which involves conditioning with a drug as the unconditioned stimulus. Now, uh, drugs don't end, so a drug in the body is the unconditioned stimulus. And uh, drugs don't enter our body <laughs> sort of telepathically. They have to be actively introduced. And the active introduction of the drug involves certain cues Think about um, drinking alcohol, for example. Alcohol is the drug, and alcohol isn't just <laughs> magically appears when you walk into a bar. You have to order a drink. You have to go to the bar. You have to order a drink. You have to pay for the drink, and then you start drinking it, which has tastes and also other properties, and it occurs in the context of a bar and so forth, and those are all stimuli that allow you to predict that you're going to have uh, this drug in, in your body. So uh, these drug administration cues become signals for the drug. And uh, just as with the fear conditioning and sign tracking example, the condition stimulus is going to activate preparations for the U.S., uh, if you're uh, uh, drinking alcohol, uh, what kind of preparations physiology, physiologically should your body make uh, to the alcohol? Well, alcohol is a depressant. It depresses the nervous system. Uh, the, our physio physiology is designed to keep things at an even keel, as we saw with the opponent process theory of motivation. If you're going to have something that depresses uh, the nervous system, and that's going to, in order to prepare for that, you need opponent mechanisms that compensate for that nervous system depression. And so the conditioned stimulus is actually going to create activation and neural excitation such that when the drug actually enters the body, uh, it will have less of an impact. And that's what you see with uh, habitual drinkers. Habitual drinkers don't get drunk as fast um, because they, uh, uh, they've received lots of conditioning trials in which drug administration cues uh, serve to prime your physiology so as to more effectively cope with the impact of the drug and essentially neutralize the drug. So what's happening here is that the, con the conditioned response to these drug administration cues is actually modifying how you respond to the unconditioned stimulus. 
And uh, uh, if we, this is not unique to drug conditioning. It also occurs in fear conditioning. If you know that you're going to get a, a really aversive stimulus, your body prepares for that. And there is a conditioned analgesic response that's activated during the freezing response so that the shock that you get is not as painful. So this kind of condition modification of the unconditioned responses occurs in a variety of situations. And I'm sure we would see it in the, with food as the unconditioned stimulus, like, but people just haven't done those kinds of experiments. Uh, oh, there have been a lot of experiments on how conditioning modifies the response to an unconditioned stimulus in a sexual behavior system. And uh, most of these have uh, involved uh, male, uh, male animal, animal subjects where the unconditioned stimulus is, act, is access to a female and, and then uh, social and copulatory responses that occur with a female. If we, uh, this next slide shows what it, the various ways in which uh, sexual conditioning um, changes how a male interacts with a sexual partner. So what we're talking about here is not a response to the conditioned stimulus, but changes in how the male interacts with the female after the conditioned stimulus has been presented. And uh, uh, prominent finding and first uh, result of this sort is there's a decreased latency uh, to copulate. Uh, the male releases more sperm. The female shows more receptivity. There's increased uh, courtship behavior, increased numbers of offspring produced. And uh, there's also an a, a advantage, a paternity advantage for conditioned males in a sexual competition situation. So uh, what uh, these results uh, show us is that Pav Pavlovian conditioned responding is very complicated. It occurs at many levels. It occurs in the level of physiology. It occurs at the level of behavior. It's not just a glandular response like conditioned salivation. And in many ways, the most important consequence of, uh, of presenting a conditioned stimulus is not the response directly to the CS, but how the conditioned stimulus modifies how an organism interacts with the unconditioned stimulus. So uh, uh, Skinner, uh, people who adopted Skinnerian stimulus substitution view and some continue to, to uh, 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 maintain that position are missing a, a wealth of rich information about how Pavlovian conditioning help us interact more effectively with all kinds of biologically significant events. So the conditioned response is a, is a complicated story and I hope I've at least piqued your interest in uh, that it's a worthwhile uh, topic to study. Thanks very much. See you next time.